Hello there, it's Bradley again, back with another Diverse Voices episode of the Psych Everywhere podcast. So I was watching an interview on YouTube of Dr. Beverly Daniel Tatum. As you might know, she's one of Psychi's 2019 Distinguished Lecturers, and I got really interested in this one part where she told a brief story. Here's how it goes. A black parent goes to his child's school at the beginning of the semester and tells the teacher, you know, my kid is the only black kid in this classroom, so what are you going to do to make sure that my kid isn't picked on and feels included? And unfortunately, the teacher basically just said, I'm colorblind, I don't see race, so you don't need to worry. Of course, as you might already know, saying that you're colorblind is actually the incorrect answer here. Being colorblind like that is basically unachievable, right? Because you can't not see race. And it leads to negative outcomes too, because obviously you can't fix an issue if you pretend like you can't even see it. This story got me curious though. If colorblindness is the wrong answer, then what should this teacher have said? In today's episode, I got the privilege of interviewing Dr. Tatum herself. Coming up, we'll talk about how to make conversations about race less uncomfortable, you know, if that's really possible. We'll talk about whether younger generations like millennials are less likely to be racist, and a lot more. So, first things first. Dr. Tatum, what exactly should you say if somebody asks you whether or not you can see race? You know, if someone said, do you see race? The answer would be, of course I do. Uh (laughs) Why wouldn't I? I mean, everybody does. You know, it's like saying, do you notice I have red hair? Of course I notice. You know, I see a physical difference, and I understand that in a race-conscious society, those physical differences have meaning. And that doesn't mean I want to discriminate. You know, saying you see race doesn't mean you're discriminating. It means you're acknowledging the reality of somebody's life. Like, you know, it's like saying I don't notice you're in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. Well, if you don't notice I'm in a wheelchair, you might not make a ramp. Uh You know, I need a ramp. What what should the teacher have said with regard to uh, how he was going to watch after that child and... uh, well, I think that, I, you know, so to use that particular example, uh-huh. if um, if a parent of a child who is going to be an underrepresented minority in that classroom, let's say a black parent talking to uh, a teacher about the child's experience in what is otherwise an all-white classroom, and to ask the teacher, you know, I have some concerns about this, I think the first thing the teacher might do is ask the parent more specifically, tell me more about what your concerns Mm -hmm. are. And the parent might say, well, I'm concerned that my child's not going to see himself in the textbooks or um, in the curriculum that you're providing. And then the teacher might say, well, I understand that concern and here's what I'm doing about it. You know, here's the ways in which I'm trying to diversify our curriculum. Here are the ways in which I want to make sure that all of my students see themselves represented in the classroom. You may notice, parent, that I have uh, posters around the classroom that depict children of all backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Um, I have been working on improving the book resources in our classroom library so that not just your child, but that every kid will have exposure to the wide range of human diversity um, as part of their educational experience. You know, but I would be very interested to know what you think, parent, would be Mm -hmm. most helpful, you know, based on your experience. You may have been in the same position your child was in as one of you kids of color in a classroom. What was most helpful to you? You know, it'd be open to be open to a conversation, uh, I think would be very helpful. So um are younger generations like millennials and, and even the, the students now are are they less likely to be racist than in the past? Well I think it depends on what you mean by racist. Uh-huh. So, you know, uh, in my book, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? I, uh, and other conversations about race, I am very intentional in defining terms. And if we mean, are they less likely to be actively prejudiced? Um, they might be. There's evidence that suggests that um, over time, 
10, only 10 to 15 percent of Americans openly express prejudice against black Americans. So it's less common, for example, for people to use racial slurs, though, of course, we see still plenty of examples in social media. And, you know, we read about examples um, in the news about uh teachers and students exercising bad judgment in these areas, generally speaking, overtly expressed prejudice is less common today than, let's say, 25 or 30 years ago, though there is concern that since the election, the national election in 2016, organizations like the Southern Poverty Law Center have reported a rise in racial um, harassment as well as anti-Semitic, anti-Muslim harassment of individuals. And that, and most of that harassment is occurring in schools, which suggests that um, young people are participating in it. That said, um, we do know that, for example, surveys show that this generation, the youngest generation, certainly is the most diverse generation in the United States and is more accepting, for example, of interracial dating or things like that. But we also know that there's still a lot of implicit bias, um, attitudes that may not be part of our conscious awareness, but that still lead to discriminatory behavior. And that seems to be widespread um, across all demographics. Sort of playing off the title of, of one of your books, uh, do you think that there will ever come a time when all the kids will ever intermingle completely together in the cafeteria? If so, what can we do to encourage that outcome? Well, I think that there are certainly places where you do see kids of all backgrounds engaging with one another. And um, and developmentally, there are times when you see that. So um, the challenge, of course, is that in American society today, there are very few places where all those kids are in the same place together. Um, today, we're having our conversation on May 17th, 2019. Mm -hmm. Today happens to be the 65th anniversary of the Brown versus Board of Education decision. And sadly, even though um, state-sanctioned school segregation was outlawed by that Supreme Court decision, we know that today in 2019, public education is actually more segregated than it was in the 1990s. And there are lots of reasons for that, but the primary reason is that we increasingly rely on neighborhood school assignments and neighborhoods remain socially segregated, racially segregated. So if you're a white kid growing up in an all-white neighborhood, you're not going to have much opportunity mm -hmm. to intermingle with black kids and Hispanic kids. If you're a black and, or a Hispanic kid going to a school that is um, basically just black and Hispanic kids going to school together in urban environments, for example, then you're not going to have much opportunity to mingle with white kids. But in those few places where there is a very diverse student body and the children are young, um, as in elementary school, you often see kids connecting across lines of difference pretty easily. The separation that we talk about when we talk about the phenomenon of black kids or other kids sitting together in the cafeteria is typically something that is observed in adolescence. So now puberty is occurring earlier and earlier. We know that. Um, and so... As children are entering puberty, not only is their body physically changing, but their brains are changing too in the sense of their ability to think in more complex ways and start to ask questions about identity. And as those identity questions are being explored, we find that the separations start to occur because young people are recognizing the ways in which they are treated differently because of their group membership. It might even be in their school that they're being tracked differently. So more of the white kids, if they're in a racially mixed school, are being sent into the um, upper tracks, the honors track, the AP track in high school, um, and a lot of the black and Latinx kids are not being put in those upper-level classes, even when they have similar academic profiles. So the um, 
structural separation that occurs in schools often results in the social separation that occurs in the cafeteria. If we were doing things differently at the structural level, we might see things differently in, at the social level as well. You're listening to another Diverse Voices episode in the Psych Everywhere podcast. And if you've been listening from the start of the show, then you probably already know what's coming up next. Real quick, let me tell you a bit more about Dr. Tatum. Dr. Tatum is a renowned expert on race. Over the years, she has published many journal articles and books, including her book that we mentioned earlier, which is called Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? and other conversations about race. From 2002 to 2015, Dr. Tatum was the ninth president of Spelman College, which is the oldest historically black women's college in the United States. Prior to serving at Spelman, she was the former acting president of Mount Holyoke College in Hadley, Massachusetts, where she was also a professor of psychology and education, and later a chair of the department. Before that, she was a faculty member at Westfield State College, and earlier, a lecturer at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Dr. Tatum earned a Bachelor of Arts degree at Wesleyan College, and a Master of Arts and Doctor of Philosophy in Clinical Psychology from the University of Michigan. She also earned a Master of Arts in Religious Studies from Hartford Seminary. As I mentioned earlier, we were honored to have Dr. Tatum as one of Psychi's 2019 Distinguished Lecturers. And for a fun fact, she's also been interviewed by Katie Kirk, so that's pretty cool too. At the time of this interview, I was seated in my office in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and Dr. Tatum was speaking with me via telephone from a hotel room near the New College of Florida in Sarasota, Florida. That's where she was asked to be a commencement speaker later that day. In addition to her professional activities, I thought it might be fun to ask her what she does in her spare time, you know, any hobbies and things like that. So. Back to the interview. I um, enjoy exercise and spending time with my husband, and I like to do jigsaw puzzles, and I'm an avid reader. I also enjoy cooking, and uh, I have lots of interests, you know. Okay. I'm very involved in my local – I live in Atlanta. I'm very involved in my local mm-hmm. community. I serve on a number of boards, and uh, remain active. Even though I've retired from being a college president, I re- remain active professionally. I give a lot of speeches. Okay. Well, uh, what kind of stuff are you reading right now? What I'm reading right now is a book uh, which is about a white nationalist who uh-huh. attended the college I'm speaking at. The title of the book is Rising Out of Hatred, The Awakening of a Former White Nationalist. And it's by a man named Eli Saslow, S-A-S-L-O-W. And he's writing about a young man named Derek Black, Uh D-E-R-E-K, Black. Um, And Derek Black is the son of the man who founded Stormfront.org, which is a white nationalist online site that uh, many would call a hate site. And Uh Derek attended... New College of Florida. I heard him being interviewed on Fresh Air um, earlier this year. And since I was going to be speaking at the New College of Florida, I thought I'd read the book and learn more about Derek, which I was interested in. He, um, as a result of his experiences in college, uh, renounced his father's white nationalist, white supremacist Uh ideology. Um, So I wanted to read about that. Okay. That's what I'm reading right now. Yeah. Uh, well, if this is what you do in your hobby and your work, um, it's, it's kind of a heavy subject. Uh, how do you stay positive well, not the during only things thing like I read. this? <laughs> <laughs> not the only thing yeah. I read. Well, I think actually this book is kind of positive. Here's somebody who, uh-huh. you know, changed his mind. So that, um, I think, so it's uh, a reminder that change is possible. I find that hopeful. Are there any other ways that we can get more people to uh, talk about race so that they'll hopefully better embrace and understand one another? Well, if you you are asking 
young people to have conversations about race, what you'll find is they often want to have those conversations. My experience as a college professor was that my students really relished the opportunity to have the conversation when that opportunity was created for them, like in a course on the psychology of racism. But I found, uh, working with students in that context, that many of them would say, you know, we didn't have these conversations when I was in high school. Um, and when I speak to audiences, as I do regularly, um, I always ask people to think back to an early race-related memory, uh, something that they recall from their childhood. Almost everyone can think of something pretty quickly. And if you ask them how old they were at the time of their memory, they will usually say somewhere between four and eight years of age. A lot of people will say five, six, seven. Clearly, they're remembering something that happened maybe in elementary school, first or second grade. And then if you ask them, did you discuss it with anyone? Well, you can, I, also, I also ask them if they had a feeling attached, like an emotion that they remember being part of this experience. And they'll often say they remember feeling angry or sad or embarrassed or ashamed or um, confused or disappointed. I mean, th not everyone will say words like that. Some people will say, I felt happy or I felt uh, loved because it was in the context of a friendly or caring relationship, this thing that they're remembering. But most people remember it as an unpleasant experience that had some negative feeling attached to it. And then I asked, did you talk to anyone about it? If we think about the five and six and seven-year-olds we know, one of the things we know is that they are pretty chatty, generally speaking. They don't filter much. They say what's on their minds. But almost always you'll find that the majority of people in my audiences will say, I didn't talk to anybody about it. And when you ask them why not, they'll say, I, I don't know, I just knew I wasn't supposed to. I wasn't supposed to talk about it. So I use that as an example to say that people have these experiences from early from an early age. They encounter uh, the social messages associated with racism in our society in one way or another. And yet when they do have those experiences, they are also getting a message from the wider world that this is not to be discussed. It's not something we're supposed to talk about with each other. Uh, we're supposed to just maybe pretend it didn't happen and just keep moving. And as a consequence, many people grow up feeling very uncomfortable about the conversations because they've been they've learned at a very early age this is a taboo topic. You have to help people get past that early socialization in order to be able to move forward with a conversation. But I find that people want to have it. They're just nervous about it. So but you what, can't solve a problem if you can't talk about it, as we said earlier. What can we do to make these conversations less uncomfortable? I don't think you can make them less uncomfortable. <laughs> I mean, I think they're going to be uncomfortable. We just have to acknowledge that. Um, you know, but there are lots of things we do that we know are going to be uncomfortable like going to the dentist or, you know, uh, you know, we do them because we know it's in our best interest to do those things. And it is, it's not the case that every conversation about race will be uncomfortable, but often they are because there's pain associated with racism. And anytime you're talking about painful topics, discomfort is likely to be generated. But it is also important to acknowledge that, um, there can be joy that comes from moving beyond pain, right? You know, mm -hmm. that if I am working on a hard problem, I might feel frustrated and get a headache working on that hard problem. But if I can solve that problem, I'm going to feel great. I'm going to feel excited about it. If I feel like I'm making progress, that's going to energize me. And that's been my experience as someone who's taught about this a long time, is that people who have not been having the conversation but get the opportunity to have it and in a supportive learning environment feel energized by that. So, and I'm, I'm kind of thinking about the media here. Um, how do we talk about race more but without causing resistance to progress 
Or is that actually well, the wrong way to look at it entirely? Well, I do think we need to have conversations, and those conversations need to be structured in a way that allow for progress. And I think one of the problems with media, uh, you know, whether we're thinking about social media or television, is that not enough time is given to really make that progress. You can't have a two-minute soundbite and have a meaningful conversation. Mm -hmm. Uh, You can't have a meaningful conversation with all the nuance that it needs in, you know, 200 char- 140 characters or 240 char- characters, however many Twitter is allowing you to have, you know, it takes time to sit with someone and have a conversation and seek understanding. So, and you can't do that if you've got, you know, four heads in a screenshot and they're talking over each other. Okay. So I think the way that we structure conversations has... um a lot to do with some of the frustration people feel about, you know, the unpleasantness of it. You have to be willing to share what you're thinking, but you also have to be willing to listen to somebody else, even if what they're saying doesn't agree with what you're thinking, and even if what they're saying makes you feel uncomfortable. You have to sit with that discomfort sometimes. So let's say if someone had made a hashtag for Orphan Lives Matter, and maybe they have, I don't I don't know. But if they had, probably no one would have ever, like, stepped out and said, wait a minute, I'm not an orphan, but my life matters too, and, and argued about that. So, yeah. so that being the case, why have people sort of resisted the Black Lives Matter hashtag and movement? I think that, um, you know, the short answer is because they're racist. Uh-huh. But, um, <laughs> um, but, you know, someone would say, no, that's not true. That's not why I said that. I mean, I think everyone wants to feel included. I was giving a talk um, not a couple of years ago at the height of the Black Lives Matter controversy. I was giving a talk, and an elderly white Jewish man um, asked a question at the end, and he said, you know, when I hear Black Lives Matter, I feel like I'm being left out, you know, like my life doesn't matter. And and I said, well, you know, when, when someone says Black Lives Matter, it sounds like you're hearing that person say only Black Lives Matter. When I hear somebody say Black Lives Matter, I'm hearing them say not only Black Lives Matter, I'm hearing them say Black Lives Matter too. <laughs> and I think, it, you know, how you respond to that phrase has everything to do with how you hear it. Do you hear it as only Black Lives Matter? I don't think anyone who's saying it means it in that way, but some people hear it in that way. And I think that there is a way that um, white people in particular are accustomed to being at the center of a conversation. You know, that just comes with the territory, living in a country that has for a long time been a white majority country. And, you know, if I tell you um, a man walked in the room and I don't use an adjective, you're likely to assume it was a white man who walked in the room. Um, You might not assume that in a conscious way, but if I asked you, you know, was I talking about a white man or a black man? You said, well, you might say, well, I don't really know. But if I'm just having a conversation with you about someone I've interacted with, if I don't specify, the default definition typically is white. And the fact that when you say black lives matter, you are centering blackness, right? You're putting it at the center of the conversation. And for some people, that may feel uncomfortable. They've been moved out of the center. And and it's like, well, you know, I'm not included in that statement. Do you think that helping people to, to understand why, why they resist something like that hashtag might help them to better overcome and even move away from that resistance entirely? Well, I, I do think that helping people see the ways that their own socialization um, filters how they hear and see things is useful. And there's a really excellent book that came out about a year ago now titled White Fragility by um, a sociologist whose name is Robin D'Angelo. And in it, she really goes into a lot of depth 
Um, the subtitle of her book is, I'll, I'll just repeat the title. The title is White Fragility, and the subtitle is Why It's So Hard for White People to Talk About Racism. Robin D'Angelo is herself a white person, and she studied this topic for uh, most of her academic career. And I think she has a lot of insight about the ways in which many white people have been socialized that make it hard for them to take in information about white supremacy, about the ways that um, policies and practices lift up and privilege white people and uh, place other groups at disadvantage. Some of that information is hard to hear if you think of yourself as living in a a meritocracy, if you're used to thinking of yourself as living in a society where race doesn't matter or shouldn't matter. And so when I'm in conversations with um, people about this subject, I often suggest that they read that book because, um, and the feedback I've gotten from people who have read it is that it does really open their eyes to their own experience in a way that um, is helpful to them. So when we first started talking, you you mentioned that you're reading a book about someone who basically turned a new leaf. Um, And that kind of got me thinking, um, let's imagine a person like that who's said and written things on social media that were totally inappropriate. Um, But now that person wants to turn a new leaf and and be sensitive and uh, knowledgeable about race. Um, Mm -hmm. what, What would you say to that person? Do you have any tips for how they can become better informed? Well, there's plenty of resources to educate oneself, certainly. I mean, if we use the example of the young man I'm reading about, you know, one of the things that happened to him was he came to college and, you know, this was someone who was um, had been taught to be anti-Semitic, had been taught to be, um, to think negatively of people of color, and he came to a college where he made friends with people who were Jewish and he made friends with people who were people of color. And it was largely through those relationships that he started to question some of the things he'd been taught. So, and we know that, and, and you know, I'm, I'm reading a particular book about a particular person, but the fact of the matter is there are lots of examples like that where people come to understand you know, often when people have the attitudes they have, it's often uh, those are attitudes that have been developed in a vacuum without actually daily interaction with others. Um, and when you have a chance to bring people together across lines of difference, where social psychology tells us that when people come together and have the opportunity to work together cooperatively toward a shared goal, you often improve relationships between those groups. That's, you know, a principle that goes back to the book The Nature of Prejudice by Gordon Allport, which was published in the 1950s. And that principle, you know, is seen, for example, on sports teams. When people of different backgrounds play together, they're all working toward the same goal, trying to win the game and uh, supporting each other in that effort. And relationships, friendships, deep friendships often develop across those lines of difference. When we think about uh, someone who says, you know, I really have not, I didn't know about blackface. You know, I just thought it was a cool thing to do for a Halloween party. I didn't know that history. How do I learn more? There are plenty of books to read. Um, A great one that I will list up um, because it's another book that I have read not long ago is titled Stamped from the Beginning. It's an award-winning book by a historian who wrote... um, The subtitle of that book is The Definitive History of Racist Ideas in America, which goes back to sort of where did these ideas come from? How have they evolved in our culture? But, but, you know, there's so many ways to educate oneself from not just reading. I like to read, but, you know, there's plenty of videos and um, educational programs and many sources of information for the person who says, I just don't know. How did you become interested, if it's not too personal, we can skip it, but how did you become interested in studying and writing about race? Well, (laughs) I'm a black person in America. Um, (laughs) So um, I would say, uh, to be a little more serious, that um, when I went, I grew up um, in a predominantly white community in Massachusetts. I was born in Florida, but my family 
moved to Massachusetts in the late 50s, 1958 to be precise. And so I grew up in a small New England town where I was one of few black kids. And when I went off to college, I was interested in psychology and I was interested in studying about the experiences of families like mine, meaning I was interested in studying about the experiences of black families living in predominantly white communities. When I graduated from college, which was in 1975, so in the 70s, most of what I read about black families was based on the experiences of families living in the rural south or urban cities in the north. Chicago, Washington, D.C., which is not really the north, but, you know, urban areas. Uh And I lived in a small town in New England. And so I thought, surely I'm not the only person having this experience. I was interested in understanding what other people's experiences had been like. And I found that there was very little in the in the psychological literature or even the sociological literature about that experience. So when I went to graduate school at the University of Michigan, I decided that that's what I was going to write about for my dissertation, the experiences of black families raising children in predominantly white communities. I was particularly interested in questions of identity development and um, socialization practices of those families. So that's how I got started. And then while I was working on my dissertation, I um, got my degree from Michigan, but while I was working on my dissertation, I had left Ann Arbor and was living in California. I got married and my husband and I moved to California, so I was working on my dissertation long distance from Ann Arbor. And while I was in California, I was invited to teach a course uh, on a part-time basis at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And that course was something called Group Exploration of Racism. Now, you know, I was not, I had never taught a course called that before, but they needed someone to teach it, and they asked me if I thought I could do it, and I said, sure. So I tried it, and it turned out to be a very empowering teaching experience because my students were so enthusiastic about the opportunity to have these conversations. I was teaching at a predominantly white university. There were very um, few black students at that university at the time, Um, a few more Latinx students uh, in that university, a few Asians. But my class was a racially mixed class, and we had really um, very thought-provoking and uh, enlightening conversations. And at the end of the semester, my students wrote in their evaluations things like, this has been the best learning experience I've had at the university. This course has changed my life. Um, Everyone at the university should take this class. And that feedback was so encouraging to me that I continued to teach it. And as I did, I taught it several times at that university. And then as I finished my dissertation and moved into a tenure-track professorship at um, my husband and I left California. We went back to Massachusetts. As I started teaching in um, those college settings in Massachusetts, I kept teaching the course. I changed the name to the Psychology of Racism and uh, learned a tremendous amount through that teaching experience. But it became clear to me that this was something that needed to be done and I should do it. So I, I, I watched your TED Talk and at the end, I think the wording you used was that um, it's important to view African Americans as victors, not victims. And I thought, what a cool, what a cool way to end off our interview today. I wondered if you could just tell me a story about an African American in the history who's a victor. Well, there are plenty of them. Um, uh-huh. I just recently read um, Frederick Douglass's uh, the Frederick Douglass biography written by David Plight. It's a massive book. Um, And yet I learned a lot about Frederick Douglass. If we think about just Frederick Douglass, for example, you know, he was born into slavery. He uh, escaped on his own. He taught himself to read. He became a prolific writer and orator. 
he, um, you know, we know about him as this um, abolitionist and someone who, you know, spoke across the country against slavery and um, advocating for the emancipation of the slaves. But even after that happened, um, what I didn't know that I learned by reading his um, biography was that he became a diplomat um, in the Lincoln administration. He was uh, part of that administration, you know, regularly met with Abraham Lincoln at the White House. And think about that. You know, here's a man born into slavery um, and yet became not only well-known in the United States, but internationally known. He spent a lot of time in Ireland where apparently he was very well known and identified with because the Irish were in their own struggle for freedom uh, from the British. And so there was a sense of common cause between the plight of the enslaved Africans in the United States and the experiences that the Irish were having. So I, anyway, I learned a lot about Frederick Douglass and of course he's an example of an inspiring figure, but there are plenty of them um, past and present. Well, I, I just want to tell you what a, a joy it's been speaking with you. Truly, um, I know race can be kind of uncomfortable, but I just want you to know that I didn't feel uncomfortable for a moment. You really are a, a positive force for equality, and I just appreciate you so much for taking the time to talk today. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity, Bradley. I have enjoyed our conversation. Thank you. Um, is there anything that you'd like to add, anything we've missed? Well, you know, we could talk all day, but <laughs> I think it was, I, I'm sure we have covered some things that will be of interest to your listeners. I think so, too. As always, I want to thank you for listening into the podcast. The show's still really new, but I'm having a blast working on it and getting to hear reactions from listeners like you. So far, responses have been positive, and we've received a couple positive reviews on Apple Podcasts, too. To wrap up today's episode, I wanted to share those with you now. First, HGS Doctor says, Great idea, a podcast for Psychi. Podcasts are hot. I'm glad Psychi has one now. The first three are very interesting and will broaden your horizons. I'm looking forward to more. Thank you so much for writing that. Um, here's another one. Calm Chicanix says, I just saw my newsletter from Psychi about the new podcast, and I'm so excited to see where it goes. I love it. I'm excited to see where it goes, too. So, what do you think about the show? I'd love to hear from you, especially in the shape of an Apple Podcast review. And who knows, maybe I'll read your review in a future episode, too. Okay, that's all for now. Talk to you again soon. Copyright 2019, Psychi, the International Honor Society in Psychology. All rights reserved.